Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, um, I thank God for ministry that's different, that looks different, that feels different, that tastes different. Um, that is, uh, that's what we're going we're gonna to aim for today in Luke 15. So if you have Bibles, turn there. Uh, very familiar passage, probably one of the most beloved chapters in all the Bible. Um, and it is the, the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And we're only going to look at the first two today. We're going to save the, last, the lost son for next week because there's a lot to unpack there. But if you haven't yet figured it out, is this microphone on? We, got, we, have, we have, okay, good. Jesus' ministry is radical. Write down that word in your notes, radical. Because this, our God's a radical God. And if you haven't figured it out yet, you're going to realize that God is a God of surprises. He is a God of, um, of, of radical work. Just when you think you got him figured out, he's going he's gonna to upend your world and show you can't box him in. You're gonna, he's going to show you you can't figure him out. Uh, he wants you to know him, but he doesn't want you to get comfortable with him. Okay? Uh, Jesus embodied that. He was the epitome of a God who surprises and shows up and does things that will go against your, um, your inclination. I mean, if you think about Jesus, here he was. He comes from this irreverent town called Nazareth. He had a blue collar, work with your hands kind of job being a carpenter. He chooses calloused and uh, crooked companions to, to live life with. Can I just tell you right now, you are allowed to journey in this world with callous and crooked people. Some of you are like, oh, I hope you're offended. Because we surround ourselves with people of this piety and of this of, of maturity. And, and guess what? You need to realize that God is a God who defends sinners and rubs elbows with society's outcast. Here is Jesus, right, who proves how radically different he was in a culture that was built on legalism. He preaches don't judge one another. In a, in a time of political unrest and uncertainty, he says to us, don't worry. In a time of where people are parading their holiness, he, he says, don't show off. In a, in, a, in a world of hate and war, he teaches us to forgive our enemies. I mean, this is revolutionary. This is radical. Recently, we've looked at him tell the rich who to invite to their parties. I mean, who does that? You invite the poor and you invite the disabled. He's a God who says, instead of you being leaders uh, finding people to serve you, you serve them. Totally countercultural. He tells the world that, you know what, I'm, gonna th I'm, I'm pretty popular, but I'm going to thin the crowds because I don't want to be popular. I don't want to be a popular God. I want to be a God who's present in a real way. So what does he do? He thins the crowd by telling them the exacting terms of discipleship. I mean, this is wonderfully crazy stuff. This is the stuff that our God wants to communicate to us because this morning we get to look at more crazy things God reveals to us with the hopes of moving our hearts in amazement. If you're not moved in amazement by God, you don't know God. Can I say that again? If you're not constantly in awe of how God surprises and works in ways you never thought possible, you are not following God. Just like Lori read, just this week, I'm going to share throughout my message, just this week I've had probably six conversations with people that have just been like mind-boggling, but awesome because this is how God works. Luke 15, check it out. So let's, let's unpack this because we're going to notice three things here that I, I really want to tease out with you. Um, there's, there's God who eats with us, number one. There's the God who seeks after us, number two. And then there's the God who rejoices over us, number three. Every single one of these points, radically amazing. Stuff that we don't stop to consider. Stuff that sometimes our theology and our doctrine and our, our right beliefs don't allow us to be moved by. And there's a reason why some would call this the heart of Luke's gospel. This is what it's about right here. Luke chapter 15 verse 1. So all the tax collectors and all the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable, saying, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? 
And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me! I have found my sheep which was lost. And I tell you that in the same way there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And he says, or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice for me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. And he says, in the same way I tell you, there is presence, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. May God write his eternal truths on our hearts this morning. So number one, there's a God who eats with us. Criminal, I know. Worthy of criticism, I know. See, here's here's Jesus who, look at verse one and two, he says, all of a sudden, all these tax gatherers and sinners come to listen to him. Now, back up, because last week, look at verse 35 of chapter 14. Did he not just end his teaching by saying, let those who have ears, let them hear? Meaning, he's just talked about the exacting terms of discipleship, and then he says, for those of you who want to know more, who who are hearing what I'm, I'm declaring and what I'm demanding, listen. And who of all the crowd says we want to know more about this discipleship? It's the sinners and the tax collectors. They're the ones, right? Notice the ones who are not listening are the religious experts. The religious pr- professionals. Can I just tell you right now, there's, there's a lot of religious professionals in this room. People who have it all figured out. This message is for you. And I, and I hope you're assaulted today. I hope you're offended today. I hope you're convicted today, right? Because this is not, this is, this is about Jesus speaking to those of you who think you got it figured out. And, and guess what? You don't. Let those who have ears, let them hear. And who are the ones who have ears to hear? The, 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 the worst of society. Notice this. Look at it. It says the tax collectors and the sinners. Can I just tell you, tax collectors were despised people. This was not an occupation you wanted to pursue. You extorted your fellow, fellow, fellow neighbor. Uh, you worked for the, the foreign government. These were not highly thought of people. And, and just in case, if you weren't a tax collector, the rest of the riffraff are under the category of sinners. How many of you feel like riffraff today? How many of you fall under the category of sinners? Yeah, you know, it's the, it's the raunchy people among us. It's the ne'er-do-wells among us. You know what I'm saying? So here's Jesus attracting the, the low lives of the, of the society. And notice what the Pharisees are doing. They're grumbling. Can you all grumble? Here's what grumbling sounds like. That's grumbling. You know people who grumble? Grumbling is not a spiritual gift. Matter of fact, it's a sin. Philippians chapter 2 says don't grumble. But the word grumble is meant to take us back to the Old Testament because what did Israel do is they followed Moses throughout the wilderness. They constantly grumbled. God's not good enough. God's not nice enough. God doesn't provide me food. God. And all they did was, gr- even though God had delivered them, he showed them how good he was, they still weren't happy. Grumbling is a state of your heart that you'll never be satisfied because you don't realize God has given you everything you needed. There's a sense of contentment. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the Sadducees, you know, they were mad that Jesus was attracting this crowd and he, was, and he wasn't paying attention to them. Remember what Jesus said? It's not the, the healthy who need a physician, it's those who are sick. See, the Pharisees didn't understand this. So they're grumbling, right? So here's Jesus, and I will tell you that you're not going to be able to hear Jesus unless you realize you need Jesus. See, this is why the people came. They, they realized they are rejected by their neighbors. They are rejected by their society. They understand how far they fall short of a, of a holy God because they look at their own hearts and there's a lot of self-condemnation, a lot of self-criticism. But I'm going to tell you what, there's hope for those of you who want to hear God because when, you, when you're in that place where you realize you need God, you're able to hear God. Can, can I say that again? Because that's too important to pass up. When you know you need God, then you'll be able to hear God. 
The person who can't hear God is the person who doesn't need God. Notice who's not hearing. The religious Pharisee. They've got it all figured out. They don't need God. Why? Because they have their own self-righteousness. But those who do need God are desperate to hear from God. And so there's this drawing power, right? And this is amazing. Because back in the garden, we do our best to sew fig leaves together and hide from God. Because we all know what kind of people we are, but yet here is Jesus drawing people. Right? These, are, these are people who are consumed with delight while there's others that are there that are consumed with disdain. Notice the two audience. Two audiences. There's those who are consumed with delight because they're like, this man speaks as, as someone that we've never heard speak before. They're delighted that this, this... And let me just tell you, Jesus, he said some pretty honest and hard things, but he did it in a context of love and compassion while there's others who are consumed with disdain because they were not having the effectual ministry like Jesus was. And yet here's Jesus being criticized again. Look at verse two. And so the Pharisees and the scribes begin to grumble saying, this man welcomes sinners. See, it's not just the fact that he is, he's hanging out. He's actually dining. And now you guys know me about food. Like here's what I love about Luke. He talks about food a lot. Here's one thing I love about myself. I, I talk about food a lot. I love it. Eating is a spiritual gift to me, so uh, I love it. So here's a God who eats with us. Eating is, is communicating in the, in, this, in the scriptures this idea of, of association and welcoming. See, it's, it, we think it's easy to love people who are not like us just because we say hi to them or we, run, we walk by them in the hallways or neighbors to them but when you actually eat with somebody that that's a level of intimacy that that the pharisees they they criticize jesus over because by eating with them he's basically saying he's he's recognizing them <gasps> how dare people get recognized how people how 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 awful that people feel welcome and here's the beauty of grace on display and jesus didn't have to do this but he did it and i want you to note two things in your notes Let's just really quick think about the things that Jesus, Jesus risked by doing this, and let's think about the things Jesus revealed by doing this. Number one, what did Jesus risk by eating with people who were tax collectors and sinners? He risked defilement because there were some people you just did not touch. There were some people you just even, you, you actually went across the street just to avoid because they were so plagued by some sort of sickness or some si sort of disease, how we view people like that. Would you, would you just be honest and look at your own heart and think about, there have been people I have avoided in my life. Because I thought if I get too close to them, I'm going to become impure. He risked defilement. He touched the lepers. He, he hugged the prostitute. He risked defilement. He risked disapproval. Because here he is, the embodiment of the law and the prophets, and he knew he would go throughout life constantly being criticized and disapproved. I tell you, that's a hard journey. When you accept God's call in your life and you realize by following God, there's going to be people who just don't like it. Have you ever experienced this? Jesus risked this for us. He risked disapproval. He risked accusations. He risked uh, 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 ruining his reputation. Can I, tell you, can I tell you what? In light of the glory of God, your reputation is worth being ruined. Maybe there's a separate message there. How to ruin your reputation. Boy, Jesus put it all on the line. And he was unlike any God they would ever expect. He turns over their world. But what does he reveal by doing this? I, I wrote down three things. He revealed, um, number one, that they had a misplaced calling. The religious leaders had a misplaced calling. They were called to shepherd the people of God, and they didn't. They were called to rescue people who were hopeless and joyless, and they didn't. And so he revealed that the religious leaders weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. We'll talk about that here in a moment. He, uh, he revealed their misplaced compassion. You know why he tells the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin? 
Because he's saying to the religious leaders, you get more excited about finding your animals and your possessions than you do in loving people. Think about the things you live for. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't live for God and people and you're living for other stuff, you're going to be incredibly disappointed. See, there's a misplaced compassion. We love things and we don't love people. But there's also a misplaced zeal. Because how much people passionately chase after stuff that ultimately in eternity doesn't matter. Right? Misplaced sheep and misplaced coin. I mean, I'm not saying they're not important, but when you're showing such energy and zeal and chasing stuff and you don't use that same passion to chase people, there's something wrong there. Think about this. Jesus is, is, is saying to us what those men mean for an insult I want you to actually wear as a badge of honor. Write these three words down. Jesus welcomes sinners. Like we're supposed to read it in the light of the, of the eyes of the Pharisees and be like, Jesus welcomes sinners like this. But Luke is saying it this way. Jesus welcomes sinners. Could that be said of you? Matt welcomes sinners. Diane welcomes sinners, right? I've been a part of ministries for, for a long time. College ministry, people in the church come up to me and go, Pastor Scott, um, we noticed the other night there were some smokers hanging out at the church as if, yeah, Jesus doesn't welcome smokers. And I sit there and go, Jesus welcomes smokers. And they're like, what? They don't, they don't understand. Like they're, Scott, we saw some people walking into the college ministry all dark and black makeup and black clothes called goths and they're like yeah they didn't know that but i had edu- they're called goths yeah jesus jesus doesn't welcome goths and i sit there and go jesus welcomes goths do, do you hear why this is important right i go to my next ministry and they find out that i like poker jesus loves poker players I'm sitting at a table one time playing poker at a sports bar and there's two gals there in a same-sex relationship with each other. And they're sharing, one is sharing how she grew up in a Christian environment but saw so much legalism and hypocrisy. And I was there just to, just to say, hey, I'm a pastor and I'm not there to change their sexuality. Do you guys realize this? You're not in someone's life who may be struggling in a same-sex relationship to change their sexuality. You know what you're there to do? Help them change their hearts. Right? Some people say, oh, going to hell, you know, you're going to go to hell being a homosexual. Well, that's not true because you don't go to heaven by being a heterosexual. Can I get an amen from somebody? Okay. You go to heaven because you love Jesus. You let Jesus take care of the rest. You know, but, but that church that I was pastoring at, Jesus doesn't welcome poker players. Jesus doesn't accept people with same-sex attraction. And here's what Luke says. Jesus welcomes poker players. Jesus welcomes those who are same-sex attracted. I know some of you right now are going, I'm I'm so offended. Good. Good. Because you have God in such a narrow box that God is trying to bust that box. This week, Lori and I were in Las Vegas. I know some of you are like, oh, three strikes, Pastor, you're out. So we're in Las Vegas celebrating our 29-year anniversary, right? And, it's, and I tell you what, it's, it just happens. Lori and I just all of a sudden just we're friendly people. I'm going to walk you through a s- scenario, and you're, n- you're not going to believe this. So we're, <laughs> so we're, we're, um, we're standing at the, at the Bellagio because you guys pay me so well here at the, at the church, so thank you. Actually, $80 to stay at the Bellagio, so, so you guys know. What a deal. So Lori and I get in the elevator, Monday morning, day of our anniversary. It's about 9.30. We're going to breakfast. We get in the ele- elevator, and there's this other guy there, and he's holding um, a, a Dos Equis, 9.30 in the morning. I mean, I guess you could start drinking whenever, right? This, this guy's been drinking all night. And, and all of a sudden, we start talking. So we're, here we are, 16th floor elevator. Five minutes from the elevator through the casino to the registration area in the lobby of the Bellagio, here's what we find out about Chris. 
He's there celebrating. His friend's being married. He's got a girlfriend who has a little boy. He loves them. He wants to commit to her in marriage. And his dad was a pastor. And at a young age, he was called to perhaps be a Lutheran minister. And he feels like this sense that he hasn't, he's let some people down because he hasn't fulfilled that calling. Five minutes. Dos Equis, Casino, we're going deep. And Lori only stopped the conversation because we started talking about Kurt Cobain and how he probably wrestled with God, Kurt Cobain, Nirvana, and how Kurt Cobain wrestled with God. It comes out in his music. And then he said to me, Chris, this guy's name, Chris says, well, I'll wrestle you right now. And Lori thought he was going to literally take me down in the, in the hotel lobby. And she says, we got to go, Chris. And she pulled me out of there. Wouldn't it have been fun if I had a story like your pastor got into a fight this week? And you know what was cool is that in five minutes, this guy felt like he just opened up his life. And perhaps he probably had Dos Equis in his bloodstream. <laughs> Cut open the vein. There goes the cerveza, right? Liquid courage, we call it, right? But I'm thinking to myself, here's a guy. Like, who has he shared this stuff with? Who do you feel comfortable sharing this stuff with? And Lori and I were just like, thank you, Lord. And we prayed with him right there in the lobby of the Bellagio. And he hugged us and he wanted to kiss us and he kept trying to put his gator up over his face and five minutes. All because it's like you just strike up conversation with, with, with somebody. <sighs> you guys, this is a glimpse of, of grace that we see that Jesus eats with, with us. And, and I'm going to just tell you right now, there's nothing wrong with, with surrounding yourself with, with sinners and tax collectors. Matter of fact, I pray you would do that. I, wa I, wa I want to rejoice with you that you have an opportunity to speak into people's lives that, you know what, the church tends to reject. And if the church rejects these people who are already living in a world of self-criticism and self-condemnation, where are they going to find hope? Where are they going to find hope? Or is your spirituality too pure you can't hang out with people like that? Then I'm going to say you're, you're missing the mission of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, their grumbling is our gospel. Do you understand this? Their accusation is our hope. If Jesus, if Jesus doesn't welcome sinners, we're all damned. And perhaps you need to make it your mantra that today, Lord, I want to welcome sinners. By welcoming sinners, you are loving people just like you. Just like you are and you were and you're going to continue to be. But here's the difference. If you have Jesus, you at least have hope. That God loves you as you are and he loves you where you are, but he's going to love you enough that he's going to continue to see his image continue to be worked in your life. Because that's what he's after. He's after to restore the image of himself in us. Can I get an amen from somebody? This is not an easy message, you guys. But this is the message we need. That there's a God who eats with us and knows us so deeply. And not only does he eat with us, he seeks after us. So here's Jesus welcoming sinners. Here's Jesus welcoming us as we are, where we are. And you need to know that when he welcomes us, and if we're, we're, we're aware of that, it's, it's obviously there's something going on, and he's seeking us. When, when you begin to discover God, it's only because he's first discovered you. You realize this? Look at, look at the, he, so, he said, so here's Jesus, right? And he now tells a story of, of two seeking people. There's the shepherd and there's the, there's the woman. And I want you to know how these seekers are two different seekers. This concept is new to the Jewish people because they they did not, in their theology, consider a God who sought after people. Now, God had an open-door policy that if you were broken and repentant, he would accept you. But their theology didn't factor in a God who actually seeks diligently after you. Isn't this just what Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 23? Check this out. Write this verse down. 
There's only one thing the Bible says that God seeks after, and here it is in John chapter 4. The hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Only place in the Bible where it says God seeks something. And what is God seeking? People who are going to worship Him. Isn't that, isn't that just mind-blowing, right? So the Jewish people hearing Jesus teach this in John 4 and embodying it in Luke 15, they can't wrap their minds around this. That there's a God who seeks after us. And I'm going to tell you right now, we're hopeless if there's not a God who seeks because we don't seek after him. That's what Romans 3 says. We, we like just doing our own thing, right? Matter of fact, there's a song we just sang this morning, and it was no, there's no accident, right? Like, I'm sitting there going, this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. Here's the song. Still we often go astray. We chase the world, forget your grace, but you have never failed to bring us back. Is that cool? Like, we didn't plan this, and all of a sudden we're like, there it is! The music and the message and all tying together that there's a God who seeks after us and not just seeks after us, but he seeks us with eagerness because he wants you. He seeks diligently after us because he loves you and he seeks diligently after you because he wants to show you a life that you never, ever dreamed possible. So here he is. He tells these two scenarios that would be very familiar to his listeners. There's a lost sheep because shepherds would lose sheep We'll, we'll talk about why, and there's a woman who loses coin, and we'll talk about why that is important. So his words are meant to not only comfort the crowd, but they're also meant to convict the religious legalist. And so Jesus, first story, I could summarize it this way. There's a God that is relentless to show that we are precious. This is the story of the lost sheep. Man has a hundred sheep, Loses one, so one-tenth, and yet leaves the 99 to go seek the one. Now, if he didn't find the sheep, he'd be totally fine. But the story is meant to communicate that word right there. That sheep is precious. That sheep is precious. The, the story is meant to say to us this morning, you are of great worth to God. Can I get an amen? I know you don't hear this. Maybe you grew up in a home that didn't talk about your worth and how precious you were. Maybe it, it communicated just the opposite. But this is a picture of compassion. And that God will go to great lengths to show you that you are precious. Yeah, you might be one of a hundred, but you're still precious to him. Can I tell you a story about Riley's lamb sometime? Actually, I'm going to do it right now. So Riley, when she was little, she had this lamb called Lammy. Don't kids come up with the best names for their, their animals? If it's a dog, it's doggy. If it's a cat, it's kitty. If it's a duck, it's ducky, right? Very creative, very inventive. We're in San Diego, and we're driving on the freeways in San Diego, and it's during rush hour, and Riley thought it would be a great idea to throw Lammy out the window. And she was two. So uh, Addison, you were pregnant with Addison, or he was just a little baby. So Lammy goes out the window, lands on the San Diego freeway. She starts bawling. My Lammy, my Lammy, my Lammy. And I'm like, well, what's going on, right? And all of a sudden, Dad just feels so compelled to get Lammy. So I'm driving the really cool Swagger minivan, because that's what, that's what dads do. And I'm driving this minivan on the San Diego freeway in rush hour traffic, pull over and play Frogger on the freeway and get Riley's Lammy. Now she didn't understand the danger. She didn't understand the risk, but I understood the fact that this little $2 dirty stuffed animal was precious to her. And that dad was, I have a story to tell, and I'm not dead. I'm not a statistic, amen? That Riley got her lammy back. And part of me was like, you better cherish that lammy for the rest of your life. <laughs> Do we still have it? San Diego tread marks and all that. Yeah, it's, it's still there. But you know what? It was something that meant something to her, and I took a great risk to do this. See, this is God saying, you know what? I could go to the store and buy another lammy, but I don't want an another lammy. I want you. See, lambs, sheep, 
They get lost frequently. You want to know why? Because they're not smart creatures. See, there's a lostness in, in relationship to the shepherd because at the end of the day, that shepherd says, wait, I started the day with 100, now I have 99. And that shepherd would risk his life and go through the ravenous and, and craggy mountains and, and terrain to find that sheep. And I want you to know something, that that sheep was lost because of its foolishness. Can you write down that word foolishness? And you want to know why it was foolish? Because it sought something that would never satisfy it when it could only find that back in the sheep fold. Let me, let me say it another way. The lost sheep is lost because he worships something more than he worships God. You will always get lost when you pursue stuff and you don't pursue God. And God knows about your waywardness. He knows about your lostness. And this is why he sets out to go find you. Because here's what the shepherd knows about that sheep. That sheep will not survive out there. There's ravenous wolves out there. There are, there are holes that the sheep, if it falls into, it will not be able to self-correct itself. And the gases inside the sheep will build and build and build, and that sheep will die because it will become so bloated, its organs shut down. It's a, it's a dumb animal, and I'm sorry, folks, but here's the reality, is that God equates people with sheep throughout the Scripture. Aren't, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Psalm chapter 14. The fool says in their life, there is no God when they don't make God priority number one. Can, I just, can we just be honest with each other? If God's not priority number one, you're living a foolish life. Can we all do this? <laughs> it's true. And yet God seeks after us. Now, the, the shepherd motif is not lost on these hearers in this, in, this, in this day. Jesus wants those religious leaders to go back to Ezekiel chapter 34. Write that, verse, that chapter down. Read it later, but I want to give you a few selections from it. Ezekiel 34. Look what Ezekiel says, and if it doesn't fit what Jesus is talking about perfectly, I don't know what does. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. What? Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. They haven't taken care of the people. They've only looked after themselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? Ezekiel continues and says this. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. And then he continues and says this in a few verses later. The prophet says, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. God says, I entrusted you with an incredible calling and you've neglected the number one thing you're supposed to do and that was to go find people who were lost and bring them back. And so you know what God does? He doesn't give up. He doesn't go, oh well, let's just go ahead and destroy the world and I'll live in eternally, uh, et eternally totally satisfied and happy. No, no. God says the rescue plan will still happen and I'll send the true shepherd who will show the restoration and rescue that I, I intend. Look what he says. He says, no longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I'll rescue my sheep from their mouths and they may not be food for them. And then he continues and he says, for thus says the Lord, behold, I will myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep, that I have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on the day of clouds and thick darkness. Like God is the one who says, even though we fail as people, rescuing people and showing them their lostness, that there's still a God who does a work that we are reluctant to do. Ladies and gentlemen, there are people all around you that are lost. Would you agree with that? And that there are people that I believe God has in your life that you are meant to point to Him who rescues. Because just like Chris in the Bellagio elevator, in the, in the Bellagio casino, in the Bellagio lobby, they're lost. And yet they need to know there's hope. The shepherds failed to care for God's people and doggone it, we're not going to. 
because our true shepherd has cared for us. Look what Ezekiel says further up. So I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, who's that Jesus, and he shall feed them, and he shall feed them, and be their shepherd, and I the Lord. And he continues, and I will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them, and I am the Lord, and I have spoken. Who's thankful that they've been rescued by the shepherd? Who's thankful that God sought you out? And he did it persistently, and he did it diligently, and he did it relentlessly. He left no stone unturned in order to find you. And this is our God. And this is like why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 that now we have discovered the shepherd of our souls. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Woo! I was once lost and now I'm found. Does anyone know the lyric? For what song? The most popular song in the entire world, Amazing Grace. How many people hear that song but don't hear that song? I once was lost, but now I'm... Sounds pretty enthusiastic. Let's do it again. I was once was lost, but now I'm found. Wow. He takes the initiative. He's diligent in the process. And he's going to seek us out. I, was re- I read a story just a couple of days ago of a, of a brother and sister who were born, separated, adopted separately, and they didn't know each other until recently. Listen to this story. So out of Elwood, Indiana, the fraternal twins live just blocks apart from each other. Karen Warner, Mike Jackman knew they were adopted but didn't know about each other until Indiana unsealed adoption records. Warner says she discovered she had a fraternal twin, a brother, and they only lived a couple blocks from each other. They were once classmates, were already friends on social media, and Jackman says the discovery, quote, filled a void in my life I didn't know was there. Can you imagine this? You've become this adult, you realize I've got a twin out there somewhere, and they just lived the next street over. And yet I'm reminded, so that reuniting of these two people is is glorious. But here's the thing about God wanting to reunite with his people. He's closer than you ever, ever imagined. Acts 17 says this, in him we live and move and have our being. He's here. And he's he's, he's saying to you, I want to be reunited with you. I I want you to be my child. I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. This is what God says to us. And this is what Jesus says moves heaven to to joy and laughter and and a party. Notice what Jesus says in verse 7. I tell you that in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who need no repentance. So don't miss what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that with the lost sheep story, the Lord tells the audience that one sinner's repentance pleases God more than self-deceiving righteousness of 99 Pharisees. Isn't that awesome? What he's saying to us is this, is that Satan's true masterpiece is the Pharisee, not the prostitute. Satan's true masterpiece is the church-going Baptist who can cross all the theological T's and dot all the theological I's, but yet whose heart is so distant from God because they are just bathed in their own self-righteousness. That is Satan's true masterpiece versus the person who's a drunk who knows they are desperate for Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, what sets off the fireworks and party in heaven? Is it the 99 legalists who complete their 99th requirement of the law on the Sabbath checklist? No, no, no. God says, yawn, that's boring. You know what gets heaven excited is that one prostitute weeping at the feet of Christ. Can I get an amen? You know what gets heaven roaring is that one thief that gasps, will you remember me this day in paradise? That's what moves the heart of God. This sets off the party in heaven like no other. You're here diligently writing your Bibles, taking notes, you're like, oh, I'm good. No, you're not. No, you're not. God looks at your life and goes, boring. But the person whose heart is quickened and moved and broken and is desperate for God, that's what sets the party off in heaven. 
Drop that bass. Boom, here we go. And God is not only relentless to show we have, of, 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 that we're precious, but God is also relentless to show we have purpose. This is why the second story is different. 100 sheep, one goes missing, one-tenth. Yeah, it's a hundredth. Woman has 10 coins, loses one. Math experts, that's one-tenth. But why is this important? Because there's something you need to know about why this woman had 10 coins and what those 10 coins represent. This was her dowry for marriage. And I'm going to tell you right now, it was a very small dowry. This indicated she was poor. And when it came to a dowry, you would offer any potential suitor, a man with, that would accept 10 dowries was obviously poor himself as well. And for this woman who would now be bound to a man with only 10 coins, realize that she probably wouldn't marry a winner, but she, at least she's going to get married anyways. But now she loses a tenth? Now that takes her to a whole different category. There's a reason why she's desperate in looking for that missing coin. Because more than a monetary value, this necklace that she would wear with these coins represented sentimental value. See, I've lost a wedding ring before. Matter of fact, let me see if I can pull my wedding ring off, right? So, you know, as much time as I spend at the beach, I love the beach. I think it was year two, year three we were married. I was boogie boarding like a monster. What that means is I was getting wiped out continually. And all of a sudden I come up out of the water and my ring's gone. And I ran up to Lori, desperate, right? Good news, bad news. Bad news, I lost my wedding ring. <gasps> Good news, we're still married. <laughs> Do you want to know how long I feverishly looked in the Pacific Ocean for my ring? Do you want to know how fruitless that is? With all the waves, with all the tide, with all the other fellow boogie boarders, right? Trying to find a ring in the sand of the Pacific Ocean is near impossible. A few years later, I ran into another guy who I, I looked, I go, that guy's looking for his ring. I could just tell. And I, what, newly married, literally, he's there on his honeymoon. Lost his ring. I said, brother, I know what that's like. And we're just like, <laughs> could we replace it? Of course. But it meant something. It meant something, right? It, it, there was a sentimental connection to it. And on paper, you're sitting there going, it's, it's no biggie. But yes, it's a biggie. My wife picked it out. This was mine. It had my name. It, had, it was me. And so while that, yes, there's monetary value, there's something so much more important to it. Here's what God wants you to know with the woman in the lost coin. When she finds that lost coin, it revives in her that their, her life is not meaningless. That there's, there's significance. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's one thing for God to find you and for you to discover him. It's another thing for you to find your identity and purpose in him once you're found. There's a guy, I just heard this story the other day. He goes around to pawn shops and buys class rings that people have pawned for money. And he goes and buys them and restores the ring to their, their owner. Can you imagine getting a ring? Get, like getting a call, right? Hey, I'm so-and-so. I have your class ring. Well, I sold that. Well, guess what? I bought it and I want to get it to you. Sweet, right? There's something so deep and substantive in this that we cannot miss out in understanding is that you have not only been sought out by God to be shown how precious you are, but once you're discovered by God, you need to know there's a purpose for your life. And people go through life without purpose. And if you go through life without purpose, you are discouraged. And you are disappointed. I'm talking to a customer right there where Mary is. Mary, raise your hand. So right there, holy moment this week. Talking to a customer who's, who's working on a, a, a book about trauma. And I'm not going to go into details about her life. She disclosed what happened to her when she was a little girl, and it is horrifying. We, we, we started talking, and she, want, she knows I'm a pastor, which is always dangerous. 
She, know, she knows I'm a pastor. She's not a believer in Christ. And she wanted to pick my brain about kind of where she's at. She's kind of at this wall. Because you can do work. You can do self-work. And there's nothing wrong with doing self-work. But I'll tell you what, you come to the end of yourself, where do you go? And I, and I told her, right there. There's a reason why God has you here. And there's a reason why we're talking. Because that wall you're facing, when you come to the end of yourself, that's when God then takes over and shows you something more glorious and more majestic and more exciting than you could ever imagine. And she's like, tell me more. And I'm like, I will. And I got to point her to Jesus. And I got to point her to the design of how we as men and women are created in the image of God. And we have been designed for purpose. And we've been designed for significance. And there's a certain intrinsic value that we have as people that what we do with our lives is meant to do something that means something in time and eternity. Can I tell you right now, you have purpose in God. And when, you're, when God's will and your purposes are aligned, you're, you're in the sweet spot. Let me say this. If you exist for your purposes and you don't think about God's will, you're going to end up desperate. But when you understand the confluence of God's will and your purposes and you understand how you can harmonize those together, you are in the sweet spot. Can I tell you something about, write down the word dreams. Write down the word dreams. Because all of us have dreams. And I'm going to tell you why our dreams fall apart. Two, what, two reasons why our dreams fall apart. Number one, one is by failing to achieve them. Have you ever had dreams that you failed to achieve? Let me just illustrate. The marriage we wanted. The success we pursued. The perfect home. Right? All those things that we, we wanted but we haven't yet experienced. But the other way dreams fall apart is this, is by achieving our dreams but still finding this nagging emptiness when, we f- when, we, when we f- we're successful. Can I tell you what words come to mind? Incompleteness. Loss. You know why? Because all of us have dreams, and I believe those things that move our hearts and our spirits are, are from God, but what we miss out on in understanding the purpose is how God wants to use them for His glory and your good. When your dreams fall under God's desires, you're in the sweet spot. You will not have meaningful existence if you pursue your dreams apart from God. Does that make sense? I, we're, we're connected. We're, we're connected. That's my wife right there. 29 years, we're connected. I don't, I don't want to come across sound like a smart aleck, so i got to preface this, this way. I'm not a smart ass, but sometimes I am. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the will of God. Where this is black and white, we live our lives black and white. But where it's gray, pray, surround yourself with godly men and women to speak into your life, Go crazy. Right? Like, you're sitting there going, is it really that easy? Yes, it's that easy. You don't need to go to a toy store and go, uh, do you have any magic eight balls in stock? Okay. <laughs> you don't have to be like, okay, uh, where, what's the horoscope say today? Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm an Aquarius or I'm a Capricorn? Like, no. Three things. Word of God, spirit of God, people of God. That's all you need. When you understand what God's will is. Marriage. Here's the criteria. Opposite sex. Believer. Done. It's, it's pretty easy, isn't it? But if you... Sex. When, where, how, why. In marriage. Enjoy. <laughs> like, people are like, it still doesn't make sense. Like, do we need to pull out like, the pictures and the... No. It's not complicated. You know why we make things complicated? Because we resist 
God's will and we demand our own. We demand our own. I want what I want and I'll spin it however I want to to get what I want. And I sit there and go, good luck. See you in disappointment lane two years from now. A- am I not right? There are people in this room right now who can testify and say he's right. Because we've all been down disappointment lane, discouragement avenue, depression boulevard. We've been there. Why? Because we chose our will, not God's. It's not that difficult, you guys. It's not that difficult. Was that, was that too smart, Ashes? A- a- ashes? That's a new word. Was that anything you would add? Perfect? Okay, good. I'll take perfect. All right, let's move on. Last point. So God is relentless, and I, and I hope you hear this. Number one, he wants to find you because you're precious to him. The Bible says you're the apple of his eye. Amazing. And not only when he finds you, he not only wants to show you how precious you are, he also wants to show you you have purpose. And there's nothing so satisfying as to leverage how he's wired you for his glory. And the last thing is this, and I I can't even believe we get to talk about this. He's a God who rejoices over us. And perhaps this was the most surprising, the most shocking part of Jesus' teaching is that when we are broken and we come to God, that makes heaven erupt in applause and laughter and cheering and joy like nothing else. Like Jesus wants you to understand this. When you are walking away from God and the moment he seeks you out so that you come back to him, there's nothing that moves heaven's excitement more than that. And can I just be honest with you? Some of us have a hard time picturing a hugging, laughing God. Can I, can I, how many of you have a hard time picturing that? Just, let's just be honest. We, we've grown up in churches where God doesn't laugh. God doesn't hug. There's no joy. It's like this. It's like the mom that sat in church, right? And her daughter was laughing and she goes, stop, there's no laughing in church. Baloney. I was going to say something else. I'll stick with baloney. There's a laughing, hugging God that exists who says, I rejoice over you. That is Zephaniah chapter 3. Some of you are like, Zephaniah, is that even a book? It is. It's in the Old Testament. It's in that really dark area called the Minor Prophets, right? Zephaniah chapter 3. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love, and he will exult over you with loud singing. This is a God who says, he is mine. She is mine. Right? There's loudness. There's gladness. There's, there's quietness, right? When are we quiet? When are we loud? I don't know, and I don't care. All I know is I have a laughing, hugging God. And Jesus says to these people, when God rejoices, heaven rejoices as well. And I know here's the, here's the holdup. Here's the holdup in our brains. The thing we fear the most, if I repent, if I am broken, if I allow God to tackle me with his love, will I not be humiliated and will not the consequences of what I have done be unbearable? And God says, you don't understand the lavish love of my God, of your God. This is what Jesus says to us. I love what St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, and and that's just a cool name, let's just be honest. What's your name, St. Bernard? He says this, he says this, that the tears of the repentant form the wine of angels. Is that awesome? Like God is moved joyfully when you are most broken. Stop. I, I don't even know how to comprehend that right now. God is most moved when you are most broken. Write, someone write that down. Put that on my tombstone. I'm serious. It's, it's in our weakness that his strength is made perfect. Right? The Pharisees, they love their own self-righteousness. They don't, know, they don't even want to embrace weakness. 
but they need to. Because until you're weak, you will never know how God is strong. And the angels, look at verse 10. In the same way I tell you, there's, no joy, there's joy in the presence of angels of God over when, when one sinner repents. Do you know the Bible says that angels look into the work of God because they are non-salvific creatures. And yet they're watching the purposes and plans of God play out and it's a mystery to them. Even though they don't understand, they're rejoicing. Why? Because God says, I'm rejoicing. And they're like, wait, God's re- oh, okay, we need to rejoice too. They're rejoicing. Why? Because God's purposes are being done. Whenever God's purposes are done, heaven erupts in joy. Wow. Can I tell you what this means to me? And I'm going to close with this, I promise. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah, I will. When that sheep is found and when that coin is found, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that there's a God who has a universe to run, galaxies to uphold, atomic particles to manage and hold together, and yet it's in this one instance of him seeking me out and loving me that that's what he's most excited about. Perseverance landed on Mars. God loves you. Yes! Right? Like, I'm, I'm excited about perseverance on Mars. Some of you are like, what's he talking about? Read the news. But you know what I'm more excited about? God loves me. God's love landed on this planet called a hard heart and has now changed my life. And that's why I sweat and that's why I cuss and that's why I yell and that's why I scream and that's why I declare to you at the top of my lungs, this will be the song till I die. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Do you know this God? I pray you do. And not only do you know him, do you understand that his voice wants you to know how precious you are, and not only how precious you are, but you have purpose. Live for him, because that's why you've been created. And as you discover that, bring others with you. Don't be so hardened to the fact that there are people not like you, or there are people that are worse off than you. There are going to be those people out there. Don't let them scare you. Let them thrill you. Drunks in an elevator at 9 o'clock in the morning. Traumatized people who have, are working through abuse. People who are just watching your life. Be ready, be available, speak hope. Because they are lost, and we pray that ultimately they would be found. And all God's people said, let's stand, let's get out of here. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for seeking after us. Thank you for being relentless and making sure we know you. Boy, God, we are, we are moved. We are, we are in amazement that you would even consider us. Think about the psalmist that says, if, if I go to the, the depths of Sheol, you're there. If I go to the heights of heavens, you are there. That you're a God who's just constantly, constantly pursuing us. What is man that you should think so highly of us? I'm moved by the fact that we are the only part of creation created in your image. And we have been created for relationship. Thank you for the restoration work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross that bridges holy divinity and sinful humanity. And thank you for the greatest news of all. That your grace, your mercy, O God, invites us to know you and love you. I pray every single man and woman in this room would know that truth today. And not just in our minds, but in our hearts. May it move us. May it thrill us. May it excite us. Thank you, Father, for this this time together. May you be glorified in all things. And we pray this in the name and work of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day. We'll see you soon, you guys. Bye-bye.